Yeah, so I was fascinated. I was going on T-SPAN, watching some of your old appearances, but you really were sort of the public face of the anti-gay marriage movement for quite some time um, and and earned a sort of grudging respect by from some people on the other side. Um, so that's fascinating. So um, maybe we can just start there. I mean, you were involved with that for a long time, and I understand that it was uh, – um, partially for personal reasons. Can you, can you tell us about how you got into the, the cause of marriage in the family? Because it was before the gay marriage thing yeah, even became no, the we, main we, issue. We didn't expect to be fighting gay marriage. I, well, I got involved because I was a pro-life atheist and my senior year in Yale, at Yale, I got pregnant and gave birth to my oldest son in October of 1982. And that kind of uh, plunged me into thinking about the things that people were saying at the time, the the cultural energy was around feminism and around the I, two two big ideas from my perception. Um, and one is that there are no differences between the sexes at all, and that gender is infinitely malleable. Those are two related versions. There are no natural differences. Um, they're all cultural creations. And I like to say that I don't think there are any men ever who actually believe that. Hmm. Don't write it. I know yeah. there's always an exception, but it's the thing that men say because when it makes women happy to hear it. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. I found that just in my own personal life, as I started to reflect that it was so obviously untrue and yet so endlessly propagandistically repeated and it was the source of, I think, a lot of problems that instead of a reformist feminism, because I, I, I think it's obviously true that the gender roles as they were conceived uh, from the 1950s were causing a lot of friction and needed to evolve in various ways. But instead we got the first of many radical uh, sexual movements or the first, the gay marriage movement really being the second one quickly uh, replaced by the transgender one, uh, which was, you know, it, it, it takes an enormous amount of energy, cultural energy to sustain a lie about human nature as the Soviet Union found with communism. Mm. And that was, so that was one piece of it. And the other was the idea, the related idea that marriage was not important. Um, and it became very obvious to me, I, li I like to say I was one of the most uh, privileged single mothers, unwed mothers in history, having both a warm, supportive, married, intact family to come from, and also uh, a Yale degree, which is extremely helpful if you're going to be an unwed mother. Mm -hmm. um, but it became obvious to me that I could not offer to my son the same things that were offered to me. I mean, I think I was a good mother, and I think compared to a lot of kids, if that's your standard, he, he was fortunate and he's a good man. So that's good. But I don't, you know, I, the, the, the lie that uh, a woman alone can do as well as a loving mother, father was, um, uh, you know, causing terrible damage. And I felt really called to confront it after both reflection and I was at the, my first job, I, w I went back to work when my oldest was three and I worked as an editor at National Review. Um, and so I started to see this social science evidence crossing my desk. And uh, so the related lie, of course, is that you don't need to be married because men and women can still raise their children outside of marriage. So I mm. remember seeing this study saying that uh, children of single mothers uh, uh, were who were being raised by single mothers were more likely not to see their father at all in the past year than to see them as often as I think it was once a month, but it was in the 80s. So forgive me, I may have it, but something like that, a very powerful study. And, you know, I felt that there was a need for young women's voices at the time. And I started focusing my writing on that. And uh, I wrote a first book which is still a really good book. And occasionally I run into uh, pastors or other young women who are, are still reading it. It's, it's out of print, but you can find it online, like everything. And it was called Enemies of Eros, How the Sexual Revolution is Killing Family, Marriage, and Sex, and What We Can Do About It. 
And it is, um, it's a very interesting book to me to, to look back on because uh, I had not read John Paul when I wrote the book, but there is a lot of um, overlap with hmm. teachings in love and responsibility. Uh, hmm. So it, it's almost, it's almost like um, it's a reflection on all of the falsehoods associated with the sexual revolution, including this idea that fundamentally it is the enemy of Eros or romantic love, because that is a reality based on sex difference. Um, and, and, and at that time I saw the women who were most likely to ideologically deny sex difference in many cases were ending up, you know, I don't know, I would just think one example at with a Turkish man who beat her occasionally, right? Mm. So that's, you know, the psychological principle yeah. that denial, the, the return of the denied, like you repress, you deny mm. it. It's almost like Victorian times when, when women were encouraged to deny the reality of sexual desire altogether. But it's that same like cultural pressure to deny reality in the service of, I don't know what, I, I, I guess, Women came, uh, educated women came to believe that the idea of gender itself was the enemy of their fulfillment as women, which is mm. one of those peculiar things that we still live in. I mean, in the form it takes now is that boys are doing very badly. That's been true for a generation on average, and we cannot stop focusing exclusively on girls. And it's a wonderful thing to focus on girls, but meanwhile, the fact that a whole generation of boys are not going to college, they're not getting into work, they're, they therefore do not become attractive partners. So you see women have a terrible, much harder time finding a, a partner because the reality is that although men are not always, but often willing to take care of women financially, women are not willing to take care of men who do not at least provide a baseline of support. Mm -hmm. Um, le leading to that great saying coming out of the African-American community, I can do bad on my own, right? <laughs> um, so it's part of the conundrum we are. That, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm just blathering on and on. So I probably should stop and, and, and let you, wh where do you want me to go with this from here? No, it's okay. That was my, you... oh, let me just cap it by saying this. So that was my life since I started as a writer around the age of 26 in New York City with my three-year-old boy. Um, and then uh, until around the year 2000, in various ways, marriage was the primary thing I worked on. I helped found the City Journal Magazine of the Manhattan Institute. Uh, I joined the Institute for American Values. I wrote a, se a second book on no-fault divorce, which is called The Abolition of Marriage, How We Destroy Lasting Love. I wrote a relatively influential book with the University of Chicago professor Linda J. Waite, which is called The Case for Marriage, Why Married People Are Happier, Healthier, and Better Off Financially, and basically joined the team that David Blankenhorn assembled in the 90s to begin to contest the idea. In, in 1990, when I entered this debate, if you said marriage really matters because children need a mom and a dad, you were a religious zealot who hated single mothers. And 10 years later, thanks largely to his work and the scholars who gathered around him, and the experience of the way it jived with the experience of cultural elites as well. You could say all things being equal, children are better off if they're raised by a married mom and dad, provided that marriage is not high conflict and violent. And nobody would disagree with that, basically. We, we hmm. basically won that debate. And I planned on spending the next decade, the 2000s, coming up with policy and cultural and other initiatives to help strengthen marriage. But instead we decided to have, I didn't decide, but the cultural, the powers that be decided to have a debate about gay marriage, which pretty much disrupted the whole coalition and put an end to those efforts. And I felt very strongly called from a marriage issue to explain that this really was a, 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 a major inflection point it's not just being nice to a tiny number of couples. We were making a decision together about what marriage is for as a public institution. And if two men are a marriage, 
then marriage is really not intrinsically about what it's been in every human society that we know of, the way to bring together the two great halves of humanity, male and female, to make and raise the next generation. And so that's that, that's why I entered the gay marriage debate. First intellectually, and then I founded an activist organization. So.